Now for the definitive opinions on Cat Person. Yeah, right. <laughs> we uh, already said everything there is to say in yep. the other episode. Yeah. All right, welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with John and Rob. Hey, hey guys. Hey, guys. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> we almost had it. All right, Rob's excited, apparently. Uh, John, this is your turn, and tell us about the story that you picked. Well, uh, a few episodes ago, we were talking about Curtis Sittenfeld's Gender Studies, and we brought up that story, Cat Person. And I hadn't read it by that time, so when I was editing the episode, I was like, I, I might as well read this. So I pulled it up. <laughs> I'm going to link to it anyway. I, I, I should read it. So I read it, and it happened to be right before I was going to write a story. And I was like, this story does a couple of things really well that I want to accomplish in the story I'm about to write. So how does it do it? So I started like analyzing. It. So I thought, well, since I did all that work, I might as well bring it into the podcast and see uh, if we could find more things to say about it. We didn't already cover everything from the last time. Right. And I'll have to remember what we even said the last time. But is there a section of the story that you would like to read for us? When Margot returned to campus, she was eager to see Robert again, but he turned out to be surprisingly hard to pin down. Sorry, busy week at work, he replied. I promise I will see you soon. Margot didn't like this. It felt as if the dynamic had shifted out of her favor, and when eventually he did ask her to go to a movie, she agreed right away. The movie he wanted to see was playing at the theater where she worked, but she suggested they see it at the big multiplex just outside town instead. Students didn't go there very often, because you needed to drive. Robert came to pick her up in a muddy white Civic, with candy wrappers spilling out of the cup holders. On the drive, he was quieter than she'd expected, and he didn't look at her very much. Before five minutes had gone by, she became wildly uncomfortable, and as they got on the highway, it occurred to her that he could take her someplace and rape and murder her. She hardly knew anything about him after all. Just as she thought this, he said, Don't worry, I'm not going to murder you, and she wondered if the discomfort in the car was her fault, because she was acting jumpy and nervous, like the kind of girl who thought she was going to get murdered every time she went on a date. It's okay, you can murder me if you want, she said and he laughed and patted her knee. But he was still disconcertingly quiet, and all her bubbling attempts at making conversation bounced right off him. At the theater, he made a joke to the cashier at the concession stand about red vines, which fell flat in a way that embarrassed everyone involved, but Margot most of all. During the movie, he didn't hold her hand or put his arm around her, so by the time they were back in the parking lot, she was pretty sure that he had changed his mind about liking her. She was wearing leggings and a sweatshirt, and that might have been the problem. When she got into the car, he'd said, Glad to see you dressed up for me, which she'd assumed was a joke, but maybe she actually had offended him by not seeming to take the date seriously enough, or something. He was wearing khakis and a button-down shirt. So do you want to go get a drink, he asked, when they got back to the car, as if being polite were an obligation that had been imposed on him. It seemed obvious to Margo that he was expecting her to say no, and that, when she did, they wouldn't talk again. That made her sad, not so much because she wanted to continue spending time with him, as because she'd had such high expectations for him over break, and it didn't seem fair that things had fallen apart so quickly. We could go get a drink, I guess, she said. If you want, he said. If you want was such an unpleasant response that she sat silently in the car until he poked her leg and said, what are you sulking about? I'm not sulking, she said. I'm just a little tired. I can take you home. No, I could use a drink after that movie. Even though it had been playing at the mainstream theater, the film he'd chosen was a very depressing drama about the Holocaust. So inappropriate for a first date that when he suggested it, she said, lol, are you serious? And he made some joke about how he was sorry that he'd misjudged her taste and he could take her to a romantic comedy instead. Did you say who this was by? No, I don't think I did. Kristen Rupenian. So, what did you think about the story, John? Because this was your first time, like you said, after having heard a lot about it. Yeah, it was a lot of what you guys had said. Obviously, um, you weren't wrong about what it was. And uh, I thought it was very good. It had this um, energy. As soon as you started into it, it just pulls you forward. And I really liked that. Yeah, overall, I thought it was a great little portrait of a really awkward interaction between two people. Mm -hmm. And I uh, thought it was well, well written, um, memorable and um, a good story. So I, I think the thing that really kind of caught me is I realized about this story that there's a lot. I think if this had come into our workshop and she had listened to our advice, and I would have been guilty of, of this as well, we would have butchered this story. Well, we do that, to be fair, <laughs> just because the nature of the workshop is the idea that it's unfinished or not published. But Well, that's true, yeah. But what do you think we would have criticized? Because she d ignores the advice about telling and showing in a really, really kind of amazing way where she tells us so much. So much of this story is 
told in places that under normal circumstances you would the advice would be don't tell that show it but it works it works really well and it, it accomplishes so much more than what would have been accomplished had all those moments been shown rather than told right so i don't know if this is going to make sense but that was kind of my takeaway after reading it now because, the show and tell thing yeah no kidding because this is the third time i've probably read it and at first i read it and i thought yeah that was a good story but i was so caught up in the fact that it had gotten legs like it did it went viral and she had a book deal overnight and all i could think was there's tons of good fiction out there it's just this is the first time a millennial audience has read a short fiction piece <laughs> yeah that was my my, was huh. my thought i was like there's yeah. tons of short fiction you guys just didn't even know where to find it this one gets elevated because i don't know i guess in part me too but the content itself is relevant to our generation mm -hmm. it was great but i was so annoyed that <laughs> of all the great fiction that's out there especially by people our age or about our time whatever it was this one and it was a simple date story anyway what i realized though reading it this third time this week and i read it twice this week so four times was what you said john where the strength of the story is the parts that she tells us which is what she's thinking not merely just what she's thinking but how she's feeling yes yeah, she how she's interpreting what he's exactly. doing yeah. and how she's interpreting what he says what he's doing all in real time all in hindsight she's having revelations like in this scene where you just read about things he said weeks or months ago that are striking her now in a different way and she's reevaluating so that by the time they're having sex you can appreciate why it is she's so confused about how she feels now this is a simple story on the surface which is why at first i was like why is this being elevated you know this is a story of a, of a girl that goes on a date has sex with a guy it's consensual but she regrets it as it's happening so i don't think the author even would call this like a rape scene it's not it's 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 not like that but it's all of the complexities that go into this interaction when you kind of barely know someone and you're trying to figure everything out and that's the strength of the piece is being in her head for all of this yeah the thing about this story that i realize is you understand her motivation in every paragraph yes. why yeah, she's no doing kidding. something in each paragraph and that was the thing i wanted to bring to the story like uh -huh. i said that i was about to write as i was like how do i make sure that as the reader goes through this you understand the character's motivation um because in this story her motivation's shifting and changing and we always know exactly what it is you mm -hmm. know a lot of times a story is a character has a motivation and that carries us through the story and it's, that's good enough but because she's changing so quickly all the time we have to be on top of that right all the time in this story and i think that's where it gets so much of its strength right is that we always know it, why she's doing things there's never a question about that yeah so it's it's told in this like close third person so it's not first person which i think lends a sort of credibility to it right she's not telling us i did this and i did that and so you believe me when i say that this is what it felt like it's almost like it's third person omniscient and so well third person close to her point of view and because we know exactly what she's thinking like we can believe it's accurate right this narrator is accurate it's not unreliable like she might be so you're reading this and you're like um you can kind of like sympathize with her i guess is my point especially in the me too era had this been told first person i don't think it would have worked she would have been almost justifying everything this is why i felt like it wasn't okay it's probably true so like the, yeah so like this close third almost gives you i don't know bird's eye view into one of these it's almost like subconscious yeah close because she's talking about seeing herself like while she while they're having sex she's imagining herself above the guy and that's when that's when she, uh, personally like that that's where the, this character becomes like the most like yeah like these two are made for each other they're both kind of <laughs> nasty mm -hmm. that's right but it's not like i don't know if it's nasty or if it's, that's just the strength of the point of view where no you're just getting like the up close like this yeah. is what she's thinking you know judge not but <laughs> right. yeah yeah i think that's absolutely part of the the story's strength is you're seeing like john made that great point of you're seeing why she's choosing what she wants to do in real time so it kind of has that cool running commentary it, probably just the whole setting the, just dating in general is a great vehicle for well it's a great it's a great vehicle for this type of pov stuff because you're when you when you're dating somebody well it's obviously what you want you want x y and z and if you get close enough to the character you're going to figure out what they want and yeah i think just the dating world and just kind of with the contemporary spin on it it's just such an easy like she she gave she made it easier on herself as writers should is just being like how do i show my my characters what they want and how to get it and like put them in a like an interesting setting and what's more interesting than like a creepy date you know what i mean it reminded me of the story that you shared last time which was the art gallery mm -hmm. i forget what it's called now bader meinhof yeah yes so by the end of the story i remember when this first came out people were really identifying with the fact that they you know had a whirlwind kind of couple weeks where they were talking and then they had sex once really one date and then by the end he calls her a 
horror over text. And what a perfect ending. It is, it was. And because by then we've learned so much about her that we know that that's obviously not, she's not a whore, but also she, what he really means by that is like, you, you were mean to me and this is an insult, yeah. you know, it's just a generic insult. <laughs> <laughs> Which is ridiculous. Yeah. It's, it's just what you call women when you want them to, you know, feel bad, no matter the circumstances, Apparently. it usually works. So, so he's just pissed off and he's reacting. And, but by then we understand her to be this very multidimensional character. She didn't mean to do anything to him, to hurt him. No. She, she feels terrible terrible about it yeah and i think that's why this story like took off because everybody has had some kind of situation like this where even if you didn't have sex and have this like very dramatic back and forth you probably went through the really quick up and down of like oh this guy's cool uh wait a second oh no we've been talking too long i've been texting him repeatedly we're about to go on our second date but i don't want it and then you gotta back out and because this guy doesn't know you and you don't know him it's becomes the most hurtful thing you can do right and someone's usually pissed like, people really identified with this story but uh, but i think the strength of it as fiction is that point of view and that she's telling us what she's thinking so fine it's a good story God. <laughs> And I think if we're talking about like what people, why so many people responded to this stuff, I think you're kind of, you're, we're also watching just how depersonalized it, like digital courtship feels and how like major stuff is missing. Not to sound like grandfather shaking like mm -hmm. a cane, but like this isn't like a good way to get to know somebody. Right. And yeah. I'm sure we've all like texted with people to get to know them. And it's just like, there's nothing there. You're mm -hmm. talking to your phone and you're, you're just setting up like little mystery stories for yourself and you're living in little fictional worlds. So, I mean, it's, you're not getting getting to know anybody and it's it's not a judgmental story which i really love and i think that's why both of these characters are kind of gross and kind of like well yeah they're people so i mean when you can kind of get someone to kind of like go like well they're kind of eh, eh, i think that's like a job well done and i think these are like two awesome i don't think what the story gets congratulated enough for are like the strength of the characters just how well drawn both of them are like i can see them i can feel them i can talk to like to these two characters so easily and pretty quickly too like she does great obvious physical descriptions of the guy but when we find out like we get the idea that like she's really cute because of how she's describing herself so she has cool like backdoor ways of describing these two as well what you're talking about with the detachment she's constantly reevaluating him reevaluating how she sees him making assumptions and then backing out of them and uh, making new assumptions that she later has to back out of it's an interesting way to present a character as a, like a schrodinger's character you know like is he or is he not yeah what we think he is i think we know soon we're just oh, yes. like watch we know but we're, but like to watch her just like that's like the whole story isn't it you're just trying to watch her figure I, I, if I would say like what is the like give me the, like the elevator of the story it's a girl trying to figure a guy out yeah yeah that's good right yeah. and we talk about this um, a lot when we talk about I think specifically writing dialogue and how can you make dialogue sound authentic and John points this out all the time is one of the really easy ways is to not always have the characters understand each other to have them interrupt each other so we saw that with the story the marriage story that we read with the two couples i can't remember anything what we talk about when we talk about love <laughs> yeah. yeah carver yeah i can't remember who wrote it or what the title is but i remember the it story was good. um <laughs> so it. yeah with a story like that everyone is talking over each other and like misinterpreting and that's the strength of this piece overall it does not just happen with dialogue it happens with text but it also happens like in every one of their physical interactions like in the car yeah sitting in the little scene in the car talking about whether or not they're gonna murder she, yeah. he's gonna murder her yeah his reaction is like what what? Like, <laughs> someone says, don't murder me, and you pat him on the knee. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, it's okay. That's such a great characterization moment. Like, yeah. I know that guy. Like, uh -huh. He doesn't know how to talk to any, like, he's yeah. struggling. Yeah. Yeah, this guy, you find out kind of late in the story when she does, because neither of them apparently is clear on each other's ages, but she's 20, so she's not even old enough to get into the first bar they go to. He knows she's in college, but then she asks how old he is, and he's like, I'm 34, is that a problem? It's yeah. Like, Only in the sense that you still haven't developed past these personality dysfunctions right. where you can't even like talk to a girl and the house sounds like a dorm room and it's weird and yeah so not to give too many details no yeah. but to rob's point these characters are fully drawn and they're real raw humans in the sense that they are trying to understand each other i think in earnest and it's just not working but by the end the guy like you know he's butthurt his pride has been damaged you know yeah she's really put them in like these great situations for just like full drama 
drama. Like, does he like me? I mean, because yeah. if you think about it, like when you're just starting to get to know somebody, it takes over your whole brain and everything. And it's like, it's consuming and it's dramatic. So why wouldn't you, like, why wouldn't you set your, st- like, why wouldn't this be a hit if it's, yeah. if all the things were, if all the planets aligned? Especially when so much of the types of stories we see this way end up well. They yeah. end up in marriage. We're, with people, with rom-com. shitty characters. Yeah. Who aren't people. Yeah. It's, it's more like you can apply this love story to yourself or something. I mean, this, this is good. I don't even, I don't even think we really know what this guy wants. He's hanging out at the bar at the end of, not to give stuff away, but he's hanging out at the bar at the end of the story. So does he want her? We know what she wants. She doesn't want him. And that's like all we need to know. But with him, it's like, we're still kind of guessing, which is part of the fun. I think which is part of the fun of the characters because well, he kind of outs himself as a prick at the end, but he's still like pathetic to me. I don't. Yeah, he is. He's not villainous. Yes. No, I, I feel like this girl would be, would have been out of his league if he was also so 20. Far, I picture so far. Yeah. Out of but yeah. he had, he had some advantage just being older. Yeah. Some and, kind of charm or something. Yeah. And, and they did have a, like an authentic banter that he probably didn't have when he was 20. But, but then, can you have authenticity on a fucking text message? You well, know? Rob, you have an iPhone 4, so I know your answer is no. But I mean, like my text still, <laughs> like they still appear and I still, don't, I still feel like I'm talking to a robot. So I mean. Yeah. No, I know. It's Especially when you when you're dating someone, I never had the pleasure of using Tinder, but I hear about people using it still, and how they'll take a conversation off Tinder and text for days and weeks before they even meet, and by then they've kind of like decided already if they want to go on this date, and if it's like I don't know. She does a really good job of it exploring all the ups and downs of what she admits is a fantasy of this guy, like who she hopes he would be. It seems weird that it took this long for a story to get big. Like this, this seems like what it's like to meet people yeah. in, I mean, since for what, over 10 years at least? Right. Smartphones. Yeah, I think that was the other thing that annoyed me. I, I really could not understand why this had taken off when this felt like such a common scenario. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that But was maybe probably. to your point, like, it just hadn't been done yet. And yeah. when it finally happened, the internet was eager and waiting. I think that's part of what makes a hit in anything, song, music, whatever, is like, oh, this is obvious. Right. We've yeah. always wanted this. Yeah, right. like, it. we've been waiting for it. Yeah. And it, it, someone delivered. Mm-hmm. I was mostly annoyed too. That allow, allow me to explain my annoyance in even greater detail. It was just like I said, a lot of these people that were reading it don't read. Yeah, they do not read short fiction. They might read books, but they're not even fiction, or they're not novels. You know, they're self help books or autobiographies. <laughs> and I'm like, when was the last time you read a short story and were so captivated by it that you tweeted? You know, I was like, you know, I do this a lot. I just don't use Twitter. So I was I was annoyed by my peers at this moment. There's great fiction out there, but we picked one about our phones to Rob's point. Yeah. So what else did you like about it, John, or what did you... There's actually one section in here where she kind of, or the, the narrator kind of pulls back from the telling. And this is when, when uh, Margot invents her future boyfriend character. Yes, yes. Yeah, and that becomes a device. It's a way for her to comment on events in the moment without the narrator having to tell us how she feels. Okay. And the, there's more showing in that than there is telling, which is, is a cool thing. It is interesting. I, I didn't, I'm just now thinking of this, but it would be interesting. I should go back and look at that happens right when she decides she doesn't want the sexual encounter to continue but she can't think of a good way out of it right without hurting his feelings yeah so then she's like summons this this image of this future boyfriend's like I'm gonna tell him the story and we're gonna laugh uh-huh. and, and say how terrible it was it's kind of a way to detach from the situation right she's like this will pass <laughs> yeah but like, so at it. that moment she has fully determined who this guy is and she is not there's no second guessing there's no questioning there's no back and forth anymore and so now she can narrate that to her invented character and we don't need all that telling through the narration that's maybe maybe that's what's happening i don't know that's just what I came up on spontaneously but. well whether or not it was an, an intentional device that way i mean that's how it functioned but i yeah. i liked it because it like you said it told you that she had decided right then that this was not going to happen yeah. <laughs> yeah like she was going to get through this and she was going to figure out how to end it later but she was already kind of relieved at seemed like to to know at least that this is how she felt that was such a high drama i love that scene it was so good holy shit that was the so, whole sex so scene. yeah it was just so well yeah. written it was just like i've never read a sex scene like that yeah where it's like the sex is just like so secondary it was it right was, it was more about everything going on in her head and like yeah. i don't know well it's what seems what's interesting in it being secondary is that it's graphic enough where you're like oh wait this is a, just a very matter of fact sex scene but to see like the characters be so repulsed by it 
side, but to still have to feel beholden to do it. Such weird, like, cultural growth stuff in action. Do you know what I mean? Like, this would yeah. not happen in another, like, in another time, in another place. If, oh, right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and maybe that's the other reason why people who don't read ever reacted to that, because maybe they're f- mostly familiar with sex scenes that are there to, you know, actually arouse you instead of gross you out, you know? <laughs> yeah. You're reading them in a totally different context. If it's not a romance novel, it's Fifty Shades or, you know, something stupid. Yeah. Where, where it's like, I guess, purely entertainment. And here it's kind of like, yeah, I'll entertain you, but I'm not going to like do it in a, in a way that you're happy with. <laughs> and again, because she has two such good characters and they're both coming together like this, you kind of realize that, well, what she wants is not what he wants, you know, or vice versa, where he's getting what he wants and she just wants to get the hell out of there. And I think that's kind of one of the ma- main important things of the scene is, right, it's not about them having sex. It's about like coming to the end of the rainbow as far as what they want. And that's like so critical. And that just happens to be like at that point. Yeah, there's, I'm going to read it anyway. But at last, after a frantic rabbity burst, he shuddered, came and collapsed on her like a tree falling and crushed beneath him. She thought brightly, this is the worst life decision I have <laughs> ever made. And she marveled at herself for a while at the mystery of this person who'd just done this bizarre, inexplicable thing. Yeah, that was awesome. That made me laugh when I read that. Yeah. Yeah, she, it's cool how the dissociative stuff just kind of like happens as I'm assuming dissociation tends to do where it's just like all of a sudden she's imagining a boyfriend all of a sudden she's watching herself do this it's yeah. cool yeah and it's a very cool trick and it doesn't call attention to itself either it seems very uh, attached to what's happening yeah and I think maybe part of that is that this narrative distance is established so so early yeah th- she has no love or hate for either of these characters you feel yeah. it's uh-huh. it's real chill yeah, yeah absolutely yeah you do, you do notice that ASAP she's got very cool tone yeah and it's not smarmy either it's so mm. easy to kind of be like oh these characters you know what I mean <laughs> like, <laughs> that's right yeah she's she's just it, like it feels like an honest presentation yeah. of the facts like and the facts include how Margot feels second to second right yes. yeah so the adjectives that she's using to be subjective aren't the they're not the the na- they're not the narrator's subjective point of view they're, those are just for the for the characters so like mm-hmm. bear like and everything those are all for for Margot right. which is another cool way to establish that distance yeah it's a cool way of like taking care of your characters like give them like if it, there's going to be a subjective tone for anything let it be theirs because that can be hard to do as a writer I feel like injecting myself once in a while or maybe you know if that's part of your thing do it I'm not saying do one way or the other but well, how she does her thing is really neat right yeah there is no judgment no I, I think because it's told from a female perspective in this Me Too era that's why women liked it they're like this is how it feels you guys yeah we're not trying to be jerks and, but she, she's not judgmental either yeah she doesn't no, take she's just kind of like task. she's like oh, how am I going to get out of this without you know, offending him. She she can't even send a yeah. nice text. Her friend has to pull the phone out of her hand yeah. and send it and say, you, you're gross. Like, don't text me anymore. That was cool. And she's horrified by that. It was such a vivid scene. Yeah. Right. yeah that, and that was such a 20-year-old girl thing to do. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm so sick of hearing you, bitch. Give me your phone. <laughs> That's right. Let me ruin your life for you. Yeah. And then by then, she's like, so, oh, she's so relieved. Yeah. Everything about this is just so real. Yeah. And not in like a boring after school special either. Like, you're there like <laughs> sweating with these people because it is awkward. Yeah. Well so, done, Kristen. Yes, good job. What would you guys take away from this as a lesson? Don't date anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, you got it locked down. You're good. Yeah. The main thing I took away, like when I read it, like I said, for that um, story I was writing was just making sure that motivations were spelled out throughout the story. That's what I wanted to do for the story I was about to write at the time. And I, it's sitting in a drawer waiting for revisions, but it's definitely something I'll think about during the revision process is making sure those motivations are apparent because this story just does it so well it just right. made that made that aspect of fiction like a clarion like oh i gotta mm-hmm. do that mm-hmm. yeah this is something that i just kind of came up with after talking and listening to myself talk but it reminds me a lot of the story that john picked which is also a new yorker story that i can't remember the name the title or the author of but it was the one about the, the woman having sex with the trump supporter gender studies yeah curtis so, sittenfeld great see <laughs> someone knows maybe it's because he edits this stuff but i thought it was similar in the sense that um, it was obviously it was like Baden or how do you say it Mein and Baderhoff Bader Meinhoff <laughs> I guess yeah. it, was, it was like that story in the sense that it was um, just this awkward kind of sexual encounter yeah we've had a bunch of those haven't we weird right but for that one it was it was timely 
And if people read it then and liked it, it was because we were in the era of Trump running but hadn't won yet. This is how you get in the New Yorker, apparently. Okay, yeah. so that's my Everybody's takeaway, listening. you guys. That is my <laughs> takeaway. So whether or not this was intentional, this is another story of its time. And by that, I mean of the month, of the week, yeah. of the year, of the season. Next time you want to get published, and not just published, but maybe as a prompt, think of an issue that's happening and pander to your audience. And exploit <laughs> accordingly. Yeah, yeah. Show, display your talents in a way that, you know, pretty much guarantees some kind, of, some set of eyeballs. Watch the cash roll in. Yeah. Sh- uh, this, <laughs> this Kristen chick wrote... Wrote a follow-up first person <laughs> piece in the New Yorker, kind of in response to what was being said about the story, and the takeaway was I heard this story was a prompt itself. Yeah, it was she, like she had done something in school or something, and was like, oh, I guess I'll anyway. But You're right. she talked about in the New Yorker follow-up piece, she was like, you know, people wanted me to, to get on here and tell you what it's like for your story to go viral, and here's what it was like. But also, I don't think it's the job of an, any artist to comment on the takeaway from the public. You know, like my job here is done. I I delivered something to you and you can like interpret it as you will. So she didn't really give us any insight into whether like, I don't know. She gives a fuck. Yeah. Or like it was of the time and the era and intentional that way. That's what our job is. Yes. (laughs) But I mean, then, then she was, she was the luckiest person in the world. Yeah. I mean, this was, she didn't land on earth yesterday. Like she knew what was of the time and the essence and she somehow capitalized on it. There's a worldwide bestselling author I heard say one time, he said, everyone path into success in, in writing, writing novels, writing stories, whatever it is, once they've followed that path to become successful, the industry shuts it down behind them and won't let anybody up that path uh-huh. again. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, that makes sense. I, I'm over it now. Yeah. yeah. The path is up your ass. That's where it goes. <laughs> it's, it's kind of smart that way. It's like when people when we tell people in our group what little we know about publishing, we know that when you see a vampire story taking off, you don't write the next Twilight. You miss the train. Yeah. You had to anticipate it somehow. Anyway. Rob, what is your takeaway? Uh, shout out to Twilight. Um, <laughs> 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 my takeaway was, geez, she's so great. I don't know where to start. I just, yeah, I was just like ho- hooked pretty. I like people meeting stories, I guess. Like, I'm just realizing that now. I like the last one that DeLillo did when the, the museum. It's just like, it's a really, I don't know, as a writer, I try to find stuff that's dramatic and that's fun and cool. And this, when you're meeting someone and it's exciting, that has like your heart's going. And so that makes everything else heightened. So you want like a heightened piece. And like John said well earlier, like this thing pulls you along and it moves. And that's that's kind of our job. Reading's hard and it can be super boring. So make it fun and qu- like she does it really well. And that's like, like sh- she's not, this story doesn't take off unless it's fun, unless it's interesting, unless there's tons of drama and she does it. Right. Like, that's that's what a blockbuster is. It's fun. Yeah. Not to belabor this point, but I think something as simple as two people meeting has high drama, like you said, for the average person. So you don't have to come up with something dramatic. Like, yeah, it's like there. You see a lot of inexperienced writers come up with so much plot and and hope that it's creative enough for you. You haven't seen this before, right? How many of these Boy Meets Girl stories have we read? Yeah, good point. But they're the most exciting because they're so part of our daily life that, that it's high, high, high drama for us. Yeah. We're all human. Yeah. I mean, what do we want more than each other or, you know, a family or something? So just the, to see like the beginning or like the, not the fruition of that want, but kind of like the it's it's, it's getting air sort of, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's coming out of the brain into the character's brain. Yeah, right. that's huge. That's why I like The Bachelor. Okay. Okay, edit that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks. Shoot, dude, it's porn. <laughs> <laughs>